Hastings, famous for the battle which actually took place some miles away, also has claim to fame for being one of the earliest towns to convert its tramway to trolleybus operation. 65 tram cars were replaced by 58 Guy BTX trolleybuses, 50 single deckers with Ransom's bodies, and 8 double deckers with bodies by Christopher Dodson. These double deck bodies were rather archaic even in 1928. Similar BTX trolleybuses with enclosed top decks had already been running in Wolverhampton for two years. BTX is quickly spread across the country. This is Birmingham. South Lanks Transport kept theirs in operation until the system closed in 1955. Single deckers similar to the Hastings ones were also popular in other towns. This is Rotherham. BTX chassis were all built in the Guy factory in Wolverhampton. These scenes were filmed in 1938. The trolley buses were built alongside Guy's range of commercial vehicles. This one could have been one of a trial batch built for Belfast. The first trolley bus route in Hastings ran between the Victoria Inn Hollington and the fish market. This new service began on the 1st of April 1928 with four vehicles specially decorated for the occasion. The memorial to fish market part of the route had not previously been served by trams. People who rode on the buses that day commented on their comfort and smooth running when compared with the trams. They were to remain the only open top trolley buses until Bournemouth Corporation converted some of theirs for the seafront service in 1958. The Victoria Inn end of the route was interesting as there was a reversing triangle there. This meant that trolley buses had to reverse across Battle Road onto the inn's forecourt to turn round.
Richard Watling joined Hastings and District in 1930. What were things like in those early days? You went into the depot and you got a little idea of how to be a conductor, then you went in on the road and used to have the old small punches mm -hmm. uh, with 34 lots of tickets. Mm -hmm. They're from a penny to uh, I forget what the highest value was, but you had 32 different lots of tickets. Yes. And they'll say, I was on one route only. And that was Hastings, well, the Park de Coombe, or the, the fish market. And that was in the days before they had a turn in Circle at Coombe Beach. Mm -hmm. So you had to turn your trolley bus around to Coombe Beach. You don't have to do that. No, no, no. Well, when you got to Coombe Beach, the wire ended by the bus shelter at the Coombe Beach. Two wires came off that to a junction box and switch box. Mm -hmm. And then laying along the ground was a very, very long electric cable. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was two or three hundred feet long. And the switchman that used the Denver Memorial, um, he had to come out, he used to do alternate days, eight at Coon Beach, with one bus every 20 minutes. And what you do, you pull your trolleys down, there was a short bamboo pole about, I suppose about six to eight feet long, with two rings on it, and you hook this, two hooks on it, and you hook the, hook, the hooks in your trolley rings. Mm. Right, then he put, pulled the switch over, and you drive out onto the beach, back when in the surf and come back to the same point on the opposite side of the road, mm. which time you would switch the current off, you'd take this thing off your trolleys, put your trolley back on the wire, and you come back again. Now that chap had a job of doing that, of seeing one bus every 20 minutes on freezing cold nights. How long did that last then? About a um, year, year and a half. Not extraordinarily long, but long enough to you get fed up with it, I might tell you, and long enough for us to get fed up with turning onto the beach, because it wasn't a good road, no. a long way. And then they built the turning circle. Then they built the turning the circle, they put an island in, yes. built the turning circle, and from then on we used that. You spent all days as a conductor on the Bexhill route? Um, mostly, uh, first year I was up this depot and then <coughs> Bo Peep depot. And after the first year, when I became what they call um, regular, mm -hmm. um, I went down to Bexhill depot at Bulgahide depot and stayed there the whole time mm -hmm. for seven solid years. But you came, I mean, you had to be 21 to be a driver. You had to be 21 to be a driver. What were the other qualifications? You had to be <laughs> weigh nine stone. Yes. I weighed about seven and a half to eight stone, didn't I? <laughs> so my belly was even less. Yeah. And um, you had to be about five foot eight. Yeah. Well, the best I could do is five foot five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Edwards was very emphatic on that thing. Mm. I would never have got driving if it hadn't been for Kelvin. You know, mm. if it hadn't been for him, I would never have been driving. And he was in the chief inspector, was he? He was chief inspector, he passed the drive there right. too. You didn't. You weren't passed it by the police. You were passed it by the inspector, chief inspector. Yes. And he said that he thought that little chaps could drive, or small fellows could drive as well as large ones. Mm. Is that better, do you reckon? And then, as I say, seven of us went. Um, we went learning, and you learned. You did your all your learning in your own time. Ah, oh, yes. You weren't paid. And how many hours would you be working for the you company? You had to do 100, 100 hours, and every time you got on a bus, yes. you produce your sheet, and the driver would sign at the time you got on and the time you got off. Yes. Up to 100 hours, and <laughs> you couldn't apply for a test before you'd done 100 hours. Right. So you walked away from this depot, you walked up the road, you got on a bus full of people, and you took over the wheel. Yes. After spending one hour running around this yard. That was all we did there. And you did a hundred hours driving and you your own driving. time. Then you go for a test yes. with this chief inspector. Yes. And he passed you first and time. And then of he, I passed the first time. Yes. And so did um, the chappy who was uh, inspector's brother. Inspector, I forget what his name was. 
and young Titch Mitchell. Oh, yes, Titch. Yes. And now I only got on because Titch, Titch Mitchell was an inch shorter than I am. Mm. But the, the three of us passed out. And then, for those few years until you were called up into the army in the war, mm. so what, four, three, four years, you were driving uh, full time? Pardon? You were driving full time for three or four years before, uh, yes, before going in the army? Before I went in the army, you see, I didn't start going until 1937. Yes. And I was called up in 1940. Mm. Well, when I was called up, you used to have um, to declare whether you were a conductor or a driver, mm. or a conductor driver. Now, as I'd been doing one day's driving a week sometimes, you could go two weeks now and do one day's driving. Mm. So I didn't see justi be justified in calling myself a driver. So I put them as a conductor, so they sat me in the army. See? Which is rather, I'd rather have that than stay here. Mm. And when I came back at the army, well, you know what it's like, you were on just after that. Instead of being off the list, the driving list, I was halfway up it. You were a senior man by the time you came back. Well, uh, Tom, I left, I wasn't very far from the top. Tom, yeah. I, did, I actually gave the job up. Yeah. So I didn't retire on the job at all. Yeah. Um, 1952, I came off with recurring back trouble. Yeah. Not through trolling buses, just through Atlantians. Yeah. But, so, up to the war, you had the old single deck trolley buses and the... Single, we, had, and the we had 50, I think I'm right in this story, we had 50 eight. saloons yeah. Yeah. Yes. and eight doubles. Double now, we had four in the summer, we had four doubles on the Bexhill line, mm. Bexhill Cooden, and we had four doubles on the Holland and Fish Market. Mm. And a uh, double deck was a terrible thing to drive. You tried turning one at Boat Peep, because when you went from the Fish Market to Boat Peep in the summer, you usually had holiday makers, so that when you got to Boat Peep, very few of those people get off. Mm. They, I mean, they hold 70, 50, 60, 70. No, uh, a saloon held 37, yeah, they have 57, 60 right? something. Yeah. Well, you try turning a bus round with no pair of steering, with 60 people on the steering wheel, they as big as that. Uh, at Bo Peep. Mm. Uh, took some yanking round, that's all I could do to yank a bus round like that. And during the winter months, the single deckers, the saloons. Single deckers. We had in the winter, I mean, they ran the whole service, did they? Um, they ran all the service in the winter. Ran all the service, yes. yes. Um, the uh, saloons were 9 to 58. Mm. Did they, uh, did you have any sort of memories of uh, fun and games with them, with them in the winter on the ice, you know, well, single deckers? Yes. Uh, we used to, they, what they used to do, there were six wheel buses, mm. you know. <coughs> so when the bus, it was a bad day of snow, they would put chains on the centre back wheels. Mm. The centre wheels, mm. only. Uh, did they, I can't remember, do it, well, did they drive on their twin wheels? They had a car in the shaft. Both, both three wheels. That's right, yeah, well, they used to have the, put the chains always on the centre wheels, and I came up uh, somewhere between Coon Beach and the Park Gates, somewhere along the line, I lost it at one chain. So I stopped at the park, you know, just up in Alston Road, loaded it up with a full load of people, the, uh, the third seven of their five was standing and went to start away. Going up towards Croy Road, the bus went slower and slower and slower, and I kept taking my foot off the control, picking it up, taking it off and picking it. It wouldn't pick up, it just wouldn't pick up. And every time I did it, it went a little bit slower. So when I got to Croy Road, it came to a dead standstill. And slowly but surely, it crept backwards. <laughs> yeah. You and it don't matter what, it put all the brakes on, it was still sliding backwards. And in the end, I put my hand through the window, which unfortunately was open, and I could just, and I could just see enough on the near side, and I stood about backwards into that sandstone wall at the foot of um, the hill of the Bolter Road. Mm. And I came gently to the stand at an angle to the wall and stopped dead, so everybody could get out. And of course, the, the door being on the near side, I had to angle it into the wall like that. And then they all got out. I stayed there for, that was about eight o'clock, and I stayed there for an hour and a half. Then they came up with a small van and one bag of sand. 
Some things so. He got the stuck a bit of snow from the back walls. Then he found out that I was a chamberson. And of course, in no way would he go with. And you can't jack it up on snow or ice. You can't. You can't do it. So he said, "Well, the best to do is dig it out, put some sand in, and away we went." So where we went, with. and I managed to get going up to Quarry Road. The road bends slightly there. You see, because as it went to take the bend, it wouldn't take the bend. So I slid backwards again. This time I went back into exactly the same place, hit the wall exactly the same place, but this time I bent the whole back panel in. I stayed there till about midnight because a lot of the other bus were stranded at the time. And when they came at midnight, what they did, they had the terror wagon nicely chained up. They drove up the hill, because the trolley poles were on the off side. So they went up the hill to train themselves to a trolley pole for the standard. And then they ran out a winch rope, put on the towing hook, and by hand, you know, they had, and they winched me up to the three trolley poles. Then they anchored me there, took the old um, terror wagon up another three poles, pulled me up a bit more. And so on until we got to the Langham. And when we got up to the Langham on the straight, the chap driving the terror away and said, well, you're okay now. He said, all we've got to do is drive around here and the road. You can come round and come back down the hill. I said, no, don't do it, right? So I'm not coming back, going back down that hill. If you slide backwards, you're going to slide forward. And if they start twisting sideways, you know, being fairly long, and he's, in the end I said, I'll go round back with church. So what he did, he drove in front of me, and if I started to slide, he gently He's exactly the same thing, and I'll slide into him, and he hold me there, you see. So we got to the Latin Church. They said, well, you'll have to go around the corner now, because the toilet was still off, put the toilet on one. And he said, well, you're on your own now. He said, I can't hold you back down that hill. It was a bit too heavy. So that's okay. Well, he went, I got it around the... Uh, when I got down to the bottom, there was a crossover there, not a crossover, a junction, mm. from the park, crossroads mm. that joined up with the road from the Blackburns. They came in together like that. I went to there, the maximum speed to go through there was about 15 miles an hour. I went through there about 35 miles an hour. Coasting, and um, went all the way, I fell halfway along the path before I lost momentum. But I got home like that. And when I got down to Memorial, there was a gang of fellows standing there, you know, trolley bus floats. And I said, you're the first bus. I said, no, I'm the last, I've been level snowy. Picked them all up, put them to work, and when we got to the depot, the receiving cart, that's the chap who uh, hands your ticket out, you know, to uh, when you start work. Um, oh, he said, um, you're due on, he said, at 10 o'clock. He said, will you be back? I've been there all night, since 8 o'clock at night, been there all night, frozen stiff, and they expected me to start work at 10 o'clock. And by the way, a trolley bus, you know, in the first ones, they had an enormous hole in the floor of the handbrake came to where the pedals went through, and you sat right over those holes. You had no heating. Mm. Um, I don't know whether they had electric wires or not, I can't remember. But <laughs> um, by the time you got from, say, Hastings to Cooden on the snowy night, with the draft blowing like your treads in it, you were frozen stiff. And those old trolley buses even had oil lamps, didn't they? They had oil lamps, <laughs> yes. yes. You had two front, two at the back, yeah. front, one at the back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, come in. The, um, well, you used to spend all your time lighting the oil lamps, or relighting them, yeah. and being told by the police, you'll realise that. And of course, if you lost your trolleys and you realised it was there, you could, nothing much could be seen of you on a dark, dirty, foggy night. Because we had one fog, um, whether just before war or just before war, I don't know, but it took me four and a half hours to get the memorial to Coon Beach to back the memorial. In the fog? The fog was so bad. And goodness I know, while there were in accidents, I don't know that day. And when I got back to the memorial, the, uh, the inspector said, where have you been? He said, you know you're in and a half adrift. It broke down. I said, no, it didn't break down. It It took me all my time crawling along. I finished up going down um, the park at Bexhill. Mm. I finished up at the front of the bus in the park gates. You didn't have the road a... goes down, yes. turns right, you yeah. see. 
Well, I didn't turn around, I kept going, and there was two big stone gates, pillars, and uh, off you went in. Got into them and stopped. And the conductor was walking along in front of me. It's a new trolley, he said, of about 18 foot one inch, he said, off the wire. It didn't come off, but the wire came over. Mm. It's a good job because, I mean, I wouldn't have had any power to get back. Mm. So the case of reversing, go back up, stop, yeah. There's like that the whole way to Coon Beach and the whole way back in. Mm. So instead of a rain journey, in those days it was two hours and forty minutes between um, the between the memorial, out to Coon, back to the park, and back in, rain for two forty minutes. After the war, mm. when you came back after the war, and young Derek had started then, presumably, yes. uh, um, uh, you had new new trolley buses coming in. They were a great improvement. Uh, yes, but I can't remember what year they came. Oh, we had the AECs in yeah. 1940. The BDY. 1940, the AECs came. And then the first lot of sunbeams, the utility sunbeams, they came in 47, I think it was, or 48. Mm. And then I'd gone in the Air Force when the next lot came. Um, they, they must have come in 46, the first ones. They must have come in 46, and the others came, I think, in, in 47, the last batch. I'm um, not really worried about the dates. The important thing is that the vehicles were much better vehicles, weren't they? I mean, you oh, were working yes. with a, yes, you a, had a much smoother, yes, you more had powerful... Yes, you had a more powerful, and um, you had the regenerating brake. Were you still metered? Or um, the amount of electricity you used, was that still going on? Your meter, oh yes, your meters all the time we had the trolley buses, many yes. electricity you used. And you were judged on the amount you used as to whether you stayed in your position as a driver. Yes. If you're, well, you didn't have to be all that, it wasn't all that critical how much you used, but if you were consistently a bad driver, you used a lot of power, of course, then that meant that you were coasting up to the stops instead of regenerating up the stops. Mm. Oh, by the way, they, what they had also, um, what was that brake for, uh, you put it on the lane, what they call the retarded yes, brake. Yes, It was the retarded brake. Mm. When you got out to the Lang Hotel, you switched the control handle right through to a neutral, reverse, and right round in almost complete circle until you get it in retarded. And the coasting brake. Coasting brake. But the bug actually called it a bottle of retarded brake. And you let the bus slide away from the stop using nothing except to keep the foot on the foot plate in case it didn't come in. They would build a speed of about five to seven miles an hour, slight jerk, and it would go down Alfreston Road at that speed between five and six miles an hour, but no faster than that. Mm. And you did nothing, no using no brake, nothing at all. You just locked into that speed. It was locked in that yes. position, and you couldn't take it out until you stopped. I've never tried, but what would have happened if you tried to I really don't know. It'd be a lot of fun, I should think. And when you got to the end of the park case, you would take it out of that gear and put it in the forward gear again. But of course, um, even then, this even after the war, if you did that sort of thing and you pulled then Alfton Road on a perfectly fine day with a dry road at five to mile an hour, and the traffic, motor traffic wants to go down at 25 mile an hour. You got blasted off the face of the earth, I might tell you. Because you couldn't increase the speed if you wanted to. But they were very good brake. But if you didn't put it in, you'd find well, that, if you didn't put it in, you'd find either Inspector Crouch or, uh, or Inspector French would be standing in the shop right. away well, at the bottom of the hill. Inspector French <laughs> or immediately had you for not putting your coast in brake in. That's right. We're standing at the corner of Pori Road, you know their favourite spot. And they see a bus coming down and they look at it, probably they tell from the noise whether you're using it or not, or the speed. And um, if they were on the bus, they simply lean forward, look into your cabin, and note the position of the control lever. And if it wasn't in retired or break, you'd have a telegram. It probably cost you one or two days suspension for not using it, because it was a safety device, you mm. see. I mean, after all, with about, uh, um, say, 50 or 60 people on, on a very steep hill like that, uh, using that, there was no fear of your brakes giving out. You could stop on your handbrake mm. using the retarder, you know, the coaster. Mm. The handbrake would stop you quite easily. Mm. So, I mean, it wasn't a fence, and it really was dangerous to go down there. But, of course, last thing at night when you're running into depot, 
when you see no inspectors about it, you can let it go down there. And um, if, you say, if you go down uh, Mount Pleasant, if you were to cross the top of Mount Pleasant Hill and let the bus go, you could do, be doing 50 or 60 miles an hour by the time you got down to the schools. And you wouldn't hear it coming. They were so quiet, you see. And they got, um, the sort of thing you don't do, you have to use, as they try and say, current um, Mount Pleasant Road was a place you could save a lot of current. Mm. As I said, that when you're going down that uh, road, you could see the lights of the bus coming up, go up, directly you started to regenerate. So it's quite a good re you know, regeneration. In your time in the old town, I mean, that was always a, a good place, wasn't it? Because, uh, place. yes, quite. <laughs> the old town was always an awkward and, uh, place. And the fun of Gunner Pie Street. With, and you managed to hit the wall. Two, in, two, two inches to spare between the buses. I mean, basically, yes. was, there was, what, two places you could pass? You could pass just you by could, the bottom. You could pass... Salter's Lane. Lane. Yeah. You could pass the... Uh, uh, then, uh, halfway, uh, three quarters way down. Yeah. A quarter way down, a three quarter way down. Yeah. By the steps, so high... Well, for many places. You could only pass in two places. And um, when you're in a saloon, the wall just seemed to tear above you. Mm. But you had to miss that wall by inches, no more. But if you passed another trolley bus, the trolley buses weren't really the problem because the driver would know exactly how you stood. You were passing lorries. And other traffic, I mean, that was the whole coast road. Yeah. I think, you know, well, even the bicycles there, you couldn't pass, even if a bicycle stood in the car, you couldn't pass each other. On the very bottom, where it went up that slope, and then the high pavement started, on at least three occasions, I can remember, and there may have been more. I've gone out from here with the old Thorncroft lorry we used to have, yeah. loaded, and I mean loaded, with wooden blocks and jacks. And the last occasion, I remember it was an East Kent Dennis and one of our trolleys, and they absolutely jammed solid. And <coughs> we had to crawl underneath and jack both vehicles up together, mm. one at a time, you know, jack mm. at a time, block at a time, until we got one of them level with the path yes. that we could move them off. I mean, that was the whole of that high street, the whole of the, the main coast road was blocked. Everything was having to go up Mount Pleasant by a diversion from the police. Well, I always found the biggest trouble was well, roadworks. Mm -hmm. When you had to pass the roadworks on, your, on one side on your near side or the other side, and you sit in the cabin and you would watch your trolleys going like that, literally waving to and fro, threatening cars every second, but you had to keep in that exact position. Especially when they were doing all village, you know, when they were widening there, um, doing a lot of work there, road works. Um, you came around the right hand bend, left hand bend there, and you could literally see your trolleys threatening to fall off at any moment, but you dared go more than an inch or two, ride right on the edge of the trench. So another thing that was against us, but we were using the 18 inch system, mm. the two foot, which mm. is what the trolley bases were designed for. Mm. The guys, the, the saloons and the early deckers were 18 inch, so they, they could sort of run straight. But the, the deckers were all two foot bases and an 18 inch system, which, except for the Hollington extension and the bull in turning circle, which were made to the, the new um, width, which meant he was sort of already starting to run like that, you know, which didn't help matters at all, really. Yeah, so it was highly efficient. You could take off. So at the Hastings Pier, with the same time as a Tinton bus, and you could pass him before he got into his third gear. Quite easy. In other words, the acceleration was three times more than any motor car. Am I not right, to yeah. Three times faster than any motor car. But he had you at the crossings. This is the trouble, where you had to go slowly then over the crossings, yeah, right. like the bottom of London Road, or something like that. And he could come rolling by in all the, corners. Uh, he could. It down hard. When it got competitive, you know, with the Timpsons before the war, they really tried their utmost to force you out in the middle of the road. I'm not being forced in myself. There's no fun having to bus one along the side of you, but threatening to touch with good glass at any second. He wouldn't give way, and you wouldn't give way. Usually, of course, you used to give way. I did because I wouldn't endanger the bus load of people for the sake of two more along the road there. Normally, a trolley bus would pull away on three knots at a pair of, mm. Usually, even at Portsmouth Road, you still pull away on three notches. And pick up, but you had to be very slow picking your 
you've got up to seven clicks and you've got no ordinary acceleration after that. So you have to, when you got to three and started to move, you've got to linger for a bit four and linger a bit more for five. If you do it too fast, they don't accept the switches blow it. And when they blow it, you've got to either be quick enough to pull them in before the bus rolls to a stand and go backwards, take a chance at it, or stop the bus, just do it all over again. And the number of times you can blow the switch there, can't, can't you? If you do it once, they seem to have had it fall in there two or three times after that. Well, you show right it alongside your ear, pick that handle like that, and you put your hand up behind you and pull this switch towards you to put it back in again. They play. Mm. And you imagine that was right alongside your ear. Too big to be circuit With a flash and a bang. Night time, I mean, it was quite a flash on them. Hell of a bang. And they would do it every time you accelerate too fast. Mm. Some of it, other areas that I don't remember, there's this, um, you know, this loop at Hewenden Road. It was a loop at Hewenden Road. Yeah. You yes. go along Hewenden Road and come out round by the... But there was a turning loop. Yes. Yes, but I don't remember it being used, the turning loop. Is that we used to use it. We used to use it in the summer yes. for um, a lot of bullying or, or Bex Hill vehicles to go to the Langham. Mm. And that's how they go. It's when they got on the top of, uh, uh, of Alphiston Hill. Yes. They go straight over. Yeah. And then turn right into you in the road. Oh, I see. And around the Along there on a single, just a single yes. line. And right again, yeah. coming out by what used to be the church then. And take your lay over time there, yeah. and then you hit from that road, incidentally, if there was wiring, you could either go straight on, turn left up the wall, or pull out and turn right and go back down um, Helpiston Hill. And just before the system gave up, you remember, I mean, you did, there was a, a very bad sewer collapse just about the broad gates. Yes, right. um, for about nearly a year, everything. It Everything away. had to go around the old Blacklands route, mm. and nothing had used that as a service for about 20 years. Mm. And luckily, they'd never taken the wiring down, so the whole of the service six um, and only school specials were using that route, which did then go up that <coughs> route in uh, Hewenden Road and out. Mm. And that was that involved for the conductor somewhere about, or well, one, two, three, about four pull switches on the way out. And about six on the way down. That's okay. It was just a mess of mold pool switches because they'd never used the system since the old Service 12 came on. So, you know, they'd never bothered to put electric switches in there. Uh, there was a single track in there along Battle Road mm. in 1930. The single wire ran from about a little with the shops when you first came in up to Upper Church Road. That was a single wire. But there was a great enough span of road that you could see the other bus coming in. You'd have to wait until he cleared that single wire, but you had to change the trolleys, you know, on the single wire. Well, not change them, stay on the single wire, and you had to wait until the other chap came up to you, then he could go down. Mm. And uh, that was for the first year while well, I was floating up down between this step and Bo Peek. Mm. They did the same thing around the loop, didn't they, around um, the ridge? They, that happened around the ridge at the very beginning. Oh, yes. That was single looped. That was like a single. section yeah. around by where the new hospital is. Yeah. Mm. Until they pushed the service frequency up and finished all the other work. And they came back and, and, and doubled it right through. But the ridge, the ridge was a popular route to work because it was in Germany. I mean, it was Visitors. Visitors. Yes. Yes. It was more or less. And it was less work for the conductor, presumably. In the winter, there were no, very few people around there. Yeah. It was a nice, quiet country it's route. There's a very nice place, you know, to get stuck in a snow drift. I think it was ties, twice I was stuck in, stuck in the snow drift around there. I remember in the, in the summer, because, as I say, we used to go out from here, um, trolley bus overhauls used to stop in the summer, so we either went out, it was used to go out driving. In the spring, kind of all nice and shiny. <laughs> One or two of the chaps used to go out conducting or pole painting. You had to go out. You weren't allowed to hang around in here. And so Ted Phil and myself, we used to go out driving. But we were on the spare key, as it were. We used to have mostly the odd conductors and that sort of thing. And I remember running in a little bit late one morning. Not late, but near the bone. And I was on the circles. And I jumped in the bus. I had a, a spare conductor, and away we went. And I hadn't really 
as it proved afterwards. I was a little bit late and hadn't really checked the direction. When I got to St Helens and there was the, the other one was at St Helens, standing in the same direction. I'd caught him up. I should have been going <laughs> down by the road and around that way. And I'd gone round St Helens and he was a little bit early and he was standing at St Helens waiting his time. But luckily that, I mean, they knew and I got a ticket for it, but I was able to redeem a lot of it by turning on that circle there. But of course, all the people waiting down by Emia Road were oh, all, because that was the first one up in the morning and had it. But uh, generally speaking, it was an, I mean, it was a sort of, uh, it was a happy ship, was it? I mean, it was a small oh, outfit, it was. wasn't it? It's was quite a happy firm to work with. Oh, yes, there. Quite well, the discipline was there. The discipline was there, and you yeah. expected it, though. You yeah. know, you did it because it was expected of you. So you, it came naturally. What were they? About 120 drivers, I think, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And about 120 drivers, and they've got the same number, compared to about 240, 250 people in two separate depots. Did they take extra people on for the summer? Or oh, did yes. they just take people like yes. you out of the depots? And well, the drivers, you see, stayed, remained stacking because yes. you couldn't just get a driver off the labour exchange that could drive a trolley bus. So they used to have. Winter, winter uh, conductors used to go summer driving, right. and two of us from here, and then they'd take on conductors. They'd never take on no, drivers they, because um, of the training involved. No, they didn't take on drivers direct off the low return until no. they had the diesels. Oh yeah, it's on the diesels. When they I had mean, the diesels, they were taking drivers on straight off the, but with trolley bus, you had to know the wire, that is the point. You had to know where the wires were relational to the road. You had to know where every switch was as well. Mm. There was very little changeover of staff. You know, the, the turnover rather than staff was negligible. To what it is nowadays. Mm. You knew each other from years back because you were just a trolley man. And you saw oh, well, it for the, seven years yeah, yeah. for the probation period for a driver. Seven years conducting solid, and uh, it just wouldn't. Well, it was hoping in a case to be less than seven years. I think. But you learn a lot when you're conducting uh, as regards where the wire is. Especially if you get a driver that's less than far off, far off then you put them back on again, you see. So, so you, um, you knew as a conductor where all the bad corners were of the driver? Well, you knew where all the bad And also, but mostly, of course, you get a good idea of the speed you can go around a corner in safety. Mm. You know, I mean, you can't tear around a corner like you can with an ordinary car. You had to take quite slow at times, but it was complicated by another loop line. And worse still, when we had the automatic switches. Um, John Cripps came across the memorial, where the first time the automatic switch was put on, he went to the fish market, his trolley went up to the road. Uh, also, he, I was outside the cinema to do unloading in the saloon. He came in on the double and never even saw me. Now, funny enough, my trolley's been cut off, his did, and of course, in the shop and the coming off, and him swerving away from me, because he realised what he'd done wrong, but he saw me. Definitely, as he had passed me, did, he swerved away. He finds up right in the middle of the road. He couldn't reach either wire. Mm. There was their But when the automatic switches came in, um, I mean, the drive around, they had to power or coast to, yes. to, 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 operate, them, to yeah. operate them. And there was presumably an, an indicator on one of the posts. There no. was a light. No, no lights. There was nothing. The only, the only, the only, there was no lights on any of our posts, not from the time I was driving. No. Anyway. We just applied the power, and you could actually hear them click from the cab. Mm. You could normally always hear them come in, or you use um, you know, positions on poles or something like that that you mm. knew. You were clear. I mean, but on the on the coasting section, you knew that because you had a little light in the cab, mm. which told you whether your trolley wires were on or not. Well, obviously, over the dead section of the coasting section, mm. that would go out. Mm. And you to watch the light go along like that so from it to. If you if it disappeared, yes, but we never had that on the big on the on the modern double deck, so I never knew no, that. No. You had that on the old one. That's right. And yes. the most distracting thing you've ever seen your life. You're mother. worrying about whether it was going over fast. That's, that's yeah, right. This is it. I mean, after that, of course, you rely, even in the dark, you rely entirely on your own judgment, exactly where you were. If you look at the video, you'll see how little traffic there is, though, really. Mm. And that allowed you... You see, the, the biggest problem in the last year or two 
was the build up of traffic and parked vehicles that's it. Mm. that you couldn't get under your wire. I mean, the, the, the big thing about trolley bus driving is that wherever you put the bus, you must never race the trolleys. So you, you, you swung the bus around so if you could do it, so the trolleys were taking the smallest arc and the bus <laughs> taking the biggest arc. Mm. But in the end, there was so much parked cars, the traffic really were built up that you were having to ride along with your trolleys really straining. So consequently, the, the, the chances of a demand were great. And nowadays, I, I don't think you'd even move. I think that you'd spend more time putting the trolleys back on. Than if you could. Because nowadays, yes, yeah. if you could even. But the, going back to the old trolley buses, they didn't have uh, uh, foot-operated controllers, did they? You had a hand controller for that, didn't you? No. They were, were foot. I thought foot. the very first ones were. Well, well maybe they were, but not ours. No, no, not, no, not the system, the guys. They were all foot, they were foot controls. They were all foot controls, all with mm. I mean, I mean, old on that only two years after the tram came off, and no trolley bus I drove had a hand control, none. Mm. Mm. The, the old trolley buses, the, the braking was all air, whereas the, the, the double decks, mm. it was an electrical. Electro pneumatic? Yes. Yes, EP brake. feeds you yeah. in to start with. And the bottom section was all layout. Yes. So you, then, you've got a, a, a very nice sort of a click, click, gently, you know, without touching the air side of it. Very smooth braking. Very smooth braking. But the guys were devils. But uh, Richard said you could never brake progressively. It was always a dab, 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 dab. Mm. And the progressive braking would have torn the body off the chassis. That would Actually, yeah. you could bring them to a standstill, you could lay an egg on the floor, and they wouldn't move that. But it was, but it's that, that's it's very, very smooth, and it's very, very smooth. It's sort of dependent on nobody for maintaining them. Mm. Neither they think. I think the customers. Yeah, with our own blacksmith. And made everything. Pattern makers, everything, you know. What about the electrical side? I mean, the turning of um, you know, wiring. Yeah. That was. Motors and things. Wiring, wiring up motors. Up, motors. up but yeah, we used to do all the rewires with motors. And, it was all done in house. All done in the in shop in the shop up around the corner there. And turning and, and a lot of the electrical equipment was designed, actually designed there by Canuda and uh, Jack Blundell. Oh no, uh, Mr. Canuda was here, was he? Before yeah. he went to uh, Cardiff. To yeah, Cardiff, mm. in Cardiff yeah. oh, so I knew yeah. him. I knew him in Cardiff. Yes, yes. brilliant at design engineer. Yes. Well, yes we, in fact, we, we supplied people. What, what they used to do, they nearly had, apparently, uh, in the early days, um, infringed the patents on two or three occasions. But they got over it by buying, uh, buying in on one or two things, putting it on the bench, sussing it out, slightly altering, just very slightly altering something of, of no real advantage, and then pushing it out here as our own goods. We weren't selling them, no. but you know, it's, we didn't have to buy in anymore. The blacksmith was turning it out, and uh, our own, you know, um, wiremen were fixing it up. And that was it. There's another thing we used to do in here, but at a, at a night time, he'd be working here during the day, and he'd suddenly come round. This was the district superintendent. He'd suddenly come round uh, wiring tonight. This would be about two in the afternoon. There was no buy your leave or what are you doing tonight. And that meant that he'd come back here about 10 o'clock at night, join the wiring gang, and you'd be all night out rewiring a section. They'd be doing the wiring, because I mean they knew all the ins and outs, and whoever they took from the garage here, generally two of us, we'd be driving the tower wagons. And you'd have to get that right unless you knew about it. I tell you, you'd have to be very, very, very slow and crawl it here, right under the ears as they were laying the wire in. Otherwise, you I think you used to the play. language that used to come down from the top of that wagon. If you hadn't got that right, you know, and you, you go along the front line in the summer, with all the hotels there, and the noise when they're hitting this wire. I mean, a mile away, you hear it twanging through the wire. Now you, you hear that a quarter of a mile away. You hear the noise. Oh, easy. Well, they say uh, one mile, you'd hear the wire twanging when they were hitting with the two hammers to close the ears up on the yeah. wire, and that would go on all through the night. You know, the windows would come out. And, <laughs> the thing that used to amaze me in those days was when you bent the booms, mm. and the fitter came made a straight them on, they were bent by corks, you like that sometimes. And they patiently sit there on the roof, yeah, freezing like cold crows. weather, with enormous crows, crows yeah. wind up crows up, 
and straighten that boom up completely and look along it, you know, so you can head straight. And you strip the whole of the boom of insulation tape. Oh, we strip all insulation tape. And then re insulate it together. the whole boom. And it was the insulation tape like that on the insulation yeah. roll. And in the winter, of course, with the, with the sea air, when we were doing the sliders, the carbon would wear out. On one journey from here to Coon and back, that's one. The, the slider would have worn right down onto the brass head, yeah. which obviously you couldn't stand because mm. it would come off of the fittings. Mm. So, on a bad day, and I mean a bad day when most people want to be indoors, yeah. we'd start our late shift here at uh, half past three, pick up the carbon box and the lorry, and we'd spend the whole shift right through till ten o'clock in the evening to do the last buses mm. at the park gates. And every time one came in, it was up onto the roof, down with the trolley boom, it would be that really pouring misty rain, take the heads out and put a new slider in, do it up again, that would just last the journey. And another one would be up at Silver Hill, doing the Silver Hill or the Honiton vehicles. And you'd spend your whole shift on the roof of a trolley bus in a, in a blowing gale and pouring rain, yeah. just changing the sliders. They used to, on the, in the summer, in the... Uh, frost of the winter, they put a, a brass slider in, mm. which would cut through the ice, and that would clear it for one journey. Like it. Like it. Like it. So like you never turned it would wear, it would wear the overhead terribly. Yeah. You know, you had to get them out as soon as the frost had gone. Yes. As soon as the arcing had stopped with the early buses, then you'd have to go oh. down and take them out. So they given were, a staff bus brand, you go along the sheriff's park the whole time. Yes, yeah, so they were an insert, segregated insert, which yeah. cut through the ice. Well, mind you, I think the passion in those days were really hardy because the old saloons had no doors, no doorway, and if if snow and ice got in the bus, it would stay there all day long. Admittedly, the driver was just a bad day off. You got drunk blowing up through your, you know, right up into the cabin. But the passengers were just a bad day off. I mean, I've seen windows frosted inside and out, but they didn't seem to worry. They still got on the bus. But not per absolutely perishing cold, most things. And you get on a bus now in the winter and if one window's open, you rush to shut it up. Yeah. You can't shut up a door with no door. And they were really always really terrible, weren't they? But the very, very early, from, well, not the, the guys at the very early beginning of them, they didn't even have a, an automatic wiper. They would start got one indoors now. It was just a handle that went through the glass. Mm -hmm. With the blade outside, and so every so often, the driver used to have to spare a hand from somewhere just do that. That's right. I mean, as, as Richard said, they were so heavy, it was, it really is unbelievable, the mm. heaviness of them. I mean, you can get that now with that. Well, well, I couldn't go down the doubles. Yeah. Yeah. But, mm. After the war, there were new double-deckers. I mean, they, they, they were the height of luxury, weren't they? Oh, they I were mean, from a passenger's point of view, luxury. they the were the best vehicle they probably ever had in this town. You know, yeah, smooth, were. comfortable, warm in winter. Yeah, they were. The, the saloon, they had... Uh, both windows were split windscreens. You could have either half of, of the near side or the off side open at the same time. Mm. Actually, I do in very hot weather, you know, because with their resistance in the cabin, they used to get a fair bit of smell to the to smell. And the number of drivers that went there with bad stomachs would overlock them, you know, through the uh, fumes from the resistance. That was just, just a box, a big of that. Sitting alongside of you when you're sitting in the seat, there was a resistance. So, if you've got a very cold day, you could um, get the cemetery, say, frozen stiff. You put the handbrake on hard or the foot brake, um, and you could build up three knots and hold it there for two or three minutes. And how many times did you warm your pies up? I used to put, put them on there and warm your pies yes. up too. You, you know, they want to just, um, just a of Freddy Charles. He bought a pie, a nice pork pie, at the shop at the cemetery. And it was a, it was a terrible bagels. But he put this pie on the resistance, you see. And um, he wasn't getting. I don't think he ate half, I suppose. Anyway, he ate some. And they warmed it up and they got that resistance. Beautifully hot. When we got down to Pine Avenue, we picked up. Who do you think we picked up? We picked up the boss, didn't we? <laughs> he got hard on his nose. It literally twitched. Because he always sat in the front, always watched the driver. More than the conductor, you know, Ben Stabler's always watched him. And he got on his list, and there was a window there that much. He gently said that when driver said, Have you been eating pork pies? He said, Yes. 
They cost me, they suspended you and my mate that day. Mm. And really, one of those parents, I'm just so oh, that good. <laughs> I, I think we've covered a wide range of subjects. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been fascinating. Yes, yes. 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 Recount, listen to the experts. I mean, I, I was just a youngster. One of the BTX open toppers, number three, has survived. After withdrawal in 1939, it became a service vehicle. In 1953, it was restored to its original condition and livery and decorated with light bulbs, as seen here, for the coronation. It proudly displayed its age on a large plaque and was nicknamed Happy Harold after the Saxon figure it carried at the front. It continued to run every summer until the system closed in 1959. It's seen here on an enthusiast tour of the system shortly before closure in 1959. On Monday the 1st of June 1959, number 3 joined number 34 and a new Atlantean bus for a farewell parade. This was a fitting end as number 3 had been one of the four buses in the opening ceremony 31 years earlier. Even then the end had not come. Happy Harold was fitted with a two-stroke comma diesel engine and saw many years more service on the seafront. Even now, number three still makes appearances on special occasions. This was Hastings and District's 80th birthday rally.
Although the trolley buses departed 29 years before the making of this film, there are still many signs of electric traction around the town. Most notably, trolley bus poles in a remarkably complete condition. The old trolley bus turning point at the Langham is still well used by buses. And even the long disused Blacklands Loop still boasts its trolley poles, still serving a useful purpose, albeit not the one they were intended for. The Cooden Beach turning circle is virtually unchanged. The turning circle at the cemetery gates is still there. The hut has gone, but the trolley pole and horse trough remain. Other places have changed more. This scene appears twice in the film but is hardly recognisable. The house in the background and the tree beside it remain much the same as in 1929, but the quiet country lane is now a busy main road. This was the same junction in 1956. By 1947, reversing buses across Battle Road onto the Victoria Inn forecourt had become a dangerous manoeuvre. To avoid the need for this, the last extension to the system was added. The 300-yard extension can still be easily identified as the trolley poles are of a different type. Hastings and District Silver Hill Depot still retain signs of electric traction. Tram lines lead away from the pits to nowhere. Apart from that, there is little to show that this was once a trolleybus depot. Only the memories linger on.